pleasure of introducing Dr. Bistel. Um, I've been waiting for this presentation for a long time. Uh, <laughs> so you have a big thing to live up for. But anyway, so um, he is a professor of biology and a field station director at Schweine University. I also had the pleasure of taking his ornithology class this semester. I didn't get to finish, but you know, <laughs> sorry, life get in the, the way. Um, so his research and teaching in ecology and conservation span many years. Okay. But he considered himself primarily primarily a herpetologist. Okay, not an amphibian, but herpetologist. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> many of his published experiments evaluate the effect of pesticides interacting with competition in amphibian. Um, he has served as an editor for the Journal of Herpetology and a board member for the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, South Central Ch Chapter. As well, he is also a board member at the Riverside Nature Center in Kerrville. Okay, um, he left teaching through research he lived here in Kerrville with his amazing wife, Sarah, and their three children. Wow. <laughs> anyway, welcome. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Distel. Thank you all very much for having me. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here. Thank you, Kim, for the invitation, and, and thank you all for being so welcoming. We're going to get the slideshow pulled up here and talk about amphibians this evening. It's been a good week for amphibians. I think for a lot of them, I've seen a lot of flat toed pancakes on the road this week. So not so good for those ones, but, but probably good for the 99% more who made it and have been, have been enjoying this rain very much. Call me Chris, please. That is probably <laughs> Chris is great. It's nice to see some familiar faces here and, and meet some new folks this evening as well. All right. We're getting cozy in here. I like it. Okay. Uh, I've been working on amphibians for quite a while now, uh, among other things, but uh, amphibians are really near and dear to my heart. So I, when, when Kim asked if I could talk about amphibians tonight, um, I was very excited. And over the last week or so, I've been putting this together and thinking, you really didn't know what you got into when, when you asked for this. And I didn't either because I, I, had to, I had to shave a bunch of stuff out. Anyway, we'll try and keep it to 45 minutes. It's going to be fun. If you get tired... Just tell me to stop talking. We'll, we'll go right ahead. My contact info is up here. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out, email me, or check me out on Instagram at SU Field Station. Why are amphibians so interesting? Why are they so captivating? My nephew Gus here saw these American toads, and I think his face really captures a lot about what people feel when they, when they see amphibians. Amphibians are an incredibly diverse group of species. They've been on Earth for over 350 million years. They've been evolving longer than any other terrestrial vertebrate group. And make no mistake, they are not less evolved in that time. In that 350 million years, they've had more time to evolve to be the frogs, and other amphibians that we know today. They're extraordinarily diverse in body form. They're found in lots of different parts of the world. We'll focus on Texas amphibians today. But uh, I'll, I'll touch on this at the end, but, but they're also a really important warning for us as a, really, uh, a sign of what's happening globally. So, Real quick rundown. This is, this is probably mostly third grade stuff, but it make sure we got everybody on the same page. What is an amphibian? If we look at the etymology of that term, we've got amphi, which is double or both, and bios, of course, which is life. And this leads to uh, a framework in which we understand amphibians to live in, in this life cycle scenario that you probably all got in, again, in third grade or in high school where we've got a, a partially aquatic uh, bit of the life stage and then a, a partially terrestrial bit of the life stage. So these, these species that are living in, in so-called both worlds or both environments, the aquatic environment and the terrestrial environment. And since you gave me a podium, I'm going <laughs> to preach just a little bit. Labels are a funny thing, especially in biology. 
Um, when we put a label on something like amphibian, that means we exclude some components of the living stuff we're talking about and also of the labels that might be reasonable for other living things. So when I talk about the word amphibian, I'm using it in a particular way. I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that the, the etymology, the, the amphi and bios is the most important thing here. I'm talking about the, the biological taxon amphibia, uh, but if you'd ever like to have a talk about species or labels that we use in biology, I've got a lot to say about that. So we can we can have a chat some other time about that. There's lots of species that 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 lay their eggs and have aquatic larvae, um, but there's also these. These are some exceptions. We've got species up here who lay eggs and go go in through what's called direct development, so that little toadlets hatch right out of the eggs. There's no tadpole in a stream or a pond. We've got some species that, that spend their entire life in aquatic systems, even as adults. Here's a salamander and, and a Sicilian that have got direct development. Here we've got tadpoles that are laid on the back of a parent. They don't spend time in the water, even though they are, they are, uh, they are tadpoles. So lots of exceptions to this idea that amphibians or members of the amphibia are, are, are necessarily aquatic and terrestrial at different life stages. So to make sure we're all on the same page about who the amphibians are, let's make sure we've got some terminology down just so that the, the stuff I say makes the most possible sense. I hope, I hope that's my caveat. What's an amphibian? What comes to mind? Frogs? Good. You're my favorite. I like frogs too. Anything else? Toads, salamanders, okay, good. Those are good ones. Those, those are, in fact, members of class amphibia. That's good. That's great. Um, salamanders have this you know, four-legged, long-tailed body plan, and frogs, of course, have a, a four-legged, no-tailed body plan um, and have a really fairly unique body plan as, as members of the animal kingdom go. Not much else quite fits that bill. Uh, but the labels that we use even within class amphibia can be a little bit misleading. So when we talk about things uh, like amphibians, we're also talking about these individuals, these species that we don't have in North America but occur in the tropics, totally legless amphibians called Sicilians. These are members of class amphibia. Many people who encounter them in the wild and don't necessarily know what they are assume they're worms. They're, they're worm-like. They're slimy. They, they spend most of their time underground. Um, but we're, we're definitely including them in the amphibia. And we're also including things like toads. Biologically, the terms frog and toad don't mean anything different. Toad is just a label that people have given frogs that have bumpy skin, but all frogs have glands of various kinds in their skin. Some are bumpier than others. So the ones with bumpy skin are no more closely related to each other than they are to ones with smooth skin. So, so biologically, frog and toad mean the same thing. And literarily, they're friends. And then, of course, we've got newts. I think I heard somebody mention newt. Newt and salamander are, are mostly not different. Uh, members of one particular amphibian family, the Salamandridae, are typically all considered newts, but sometimes people will throw the word newt on any aquatic salamander, um, like this, this individual, for example. This is a, a, a siren. Um, sirens are these weird body plan things. We'll go through those in a little bit. But anyway, these are all members of the amphibia. So that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about amphibians here tonight. They all lay these jelly-like eggs. All amphibians lay eggs, even if they have direct development, and uh, all their eggs are unshelled. So that distinguishes them from, from all other uh, terrestrial vertebrates, um, although not so differently from fish. I've got so many good friends who get so excited about amphibians when I talk about them, and they say, oh, yes, they live in the water and on land. You work on turtles. And I say, ah, well, I do work on turtles sometimes, but, um, but turtles are not amphibians, even though many of them spend a fair bit of their time in the water and a fair bit on land. 
And even though salamanders uh, have a long body and a long tail and four legs, they're not lizards. Lizards aren't amphibians. They're reptiles. Um, and even the snakes that spend a lot of time in the water, like this water snake, are not amphibians. So just make sure we're all on the same page here. Just members of class amphibia. Otters, of course, mammals, you know. Not amphibians. Even if they are relatively amphibious. We're not talking. Okay. All right. You get the point. The title of this talk was, was Hidden Marvels. And I really think amphibians are amazing, overlooked animals, even though they're right around us all the time. And one of the reasons that they're hidden is because they prefer it that way. They've evolved to be, and they, they take great advantage of hiding under things, under even loose leaf litter and garbage sometimes, rocks and logs. They hide in aquatic systems uh, among vegetation or under rocks and things that are on the, on the substrate. But here in the hill country, I think one of the most amazing things that we should always remember is that there are almost always some amphibians more or less under us, even when we're walking around on land, because we've got these amazing salamanders that live down in the aquifer beneath us. And we really don't know where all they go once they're down in the aquifer. Some of these things have been tracked a few places, but man, the folks who are studying these, these neotenic salamanders that spend time down in the aquifer have just scratched the surface. I know several of these folks, and they'll tell you, the, the first thing they'll tell you is, once they go underground, we just don't know very much. All right, so... I want to touch on some biodiversity tonight. Y'all are master naturalists. You like to see, I hope, I'm assuming, I shouldn't put you in a labeled box here. I'm assuming you like uh, biodiversity. I love biodiversity. We don't have time to talk about all the, all the Texas amphibians, so I'm going to hit some highlights here. Starting with the Anura. The Anura are the group of amphibians that includes frogs and toads. Um, they're first in this presentation because they're my favorites. Uh, so let's look at some examples here. Uh, probably the most recognizable Texas amphibian for most folks is the Gulf Coast toad. Um, not For many reasons, not least of which is those pancakes on the road I mentioned earlier. Most of those flat toads are Gulf Coast toads. These are extremely widespread throughout the coastal plain, well into the hill country and other parts of Texas. They're quite recognizable by this light stripe, sometimes bordering on like a yellowish color, light stripe down the center of the back and some light stripes on the sides. That's pretty unusual among toads in North America. In fact, this particular species of toad is the only species native to North America whose ancestry, evolutionary ancestry, has come up from South America and through Mexico and into the U.S. The rest of the, the, the I should say, the rest of the toads that show up in the U.S. come from ancestry that evolved in Europe and crossed over through various ice ages. So we've got a, a pretty unique. Uh, toad here. Gulf Coast toads are pretty cool. I love working with toads when I do research because I'm not a very smart guy and I'm not a very nimble guy and toads are dumb as rocks. They are really easy to work with. They are super predictable, just like me. So when they try to get away, I know where they're going and they're not very strong. They can't jump very far, so they're easy to catch. I like toads. Um, toads are, pr are pretty neat. I mentioned those jelly-like eggs earlier. Toads lay their eggs actually not in a big mass, but in these paired strings. So all of our North American um, um, anura, frogs and toads, exhibit external fertilization, where during breeding season, a male will hold on to the back of a female. And as she ejects her eggs into the water, he will inseminate them right on top, right on top of the egg. So some of them end up not getting fertilized, although most do. But unlike a lot of other frogs, uh, toads lay them in these two long chains. I was out with students doing research this week, and we found some. I was very excited to see those. That was very, very cool. Another neat thing about the toads, members of the, the family that, that we're talking about here, this happens to be the Bufana day for any taxonomy nuts, uh, is that toads reach metamorphosis at a very small size. So there are trade-offs about how long you spend as a tadpole. 
Do you get really big so that when you come out of the water, you're harder for predators to eat and you're stronger? Or do you get out quick so you're not competing with all your neighbors and, and probably all your siblings? So we got toads that, that really cluster up. They spend a lot of time in close proximity to one another. And a fair amount of research, including some of my own shows, that, that toads in otherwise similar circumstances actually survive better in groups of siblings than they do by themselves. Um, which as a competition biologist doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but there are some, there are some mechanisms for that. But one of the things I think is coolest is that they reach metamorphosis at such a small size. That's a little Gulf coast toad we found a couple of years ago here in town. Um, it's really, really small. Um, on the same day we took this photograph and over here, you'll see my little Gulf coast toad friend. And if you look closely, uh, this is a red harvester ant. So for scale there, they're about the same size. These are really small. This time of year, well, probably in about a week, two weeks, you'll start to see more and more of them along creek and river edges. And if you spend a moment and look closely, you'll see the ground almost appear to be moving. There are so many of these little peanut-sized things bopping around trying to make their way. Most of them are going to die, don't worry, but, but they really are active at this time of year. Um, I guess it's a fair time to mention that survival from egg to adult in frogs and toads, so far what we know across most species in North America is between zero and 5%. So some years nobody makes it. Some years, if they're doing really well, 5% of those tadpoles will become adults. All right, here's another species that's pretty common in this area, often seen but more often heard the Blanchard's cricket frog. Um, these are, uh, in terms of color, pretty diverse. The same species can exhibit a bunch of different color patterns. You can see this one's got some green on it. This one's brown and gray, and this one's even got some rusty red down its back. One of the things that, um, that they share in common is a little triangle behind the eyes, kind of connects the eyes and points back toward their rump. That's always visible in Blanchard's cricket frogs, as long as they're not covered in mud, of course. But, but if their skin is clean, you can see that. And these never get very big, even as adults. Um, this is a, this is a full grown adult here and, you know, maybe, maybe an inch, inch and a half at the very biggest female would be an inch and a half. And many of this species don't live past a year. So they'll, they'll complete their whole life cycle breed, maybe breed two or three times. And then, uh, and they're done by that time next year. Another one that's pretty neat around here is the Rio Grande leopard frog. Now, in Texas, we're, we're fortunate to have three different species of leopard frog. I'm only going to talk about this one because it's the one we've got right here in town. Uh, these grow a little bit bigger than either of the species we've seen before. Um, they, they also can range from brownish tones to greenish tones, but they always have these spots, and that's where they get their name, the, these leopardy-looking spots. Uh, they have fairly large tadpoles, uh, two, three three and a half inches long sometimes. And, uh, and they can, they can spend quite a long time as, as tadpoles. Their egg masses are not strings, but they're clusters about the size of my fist. And here's a neat opportunity to talk about fecundity and amphibians in an egg mass, this size, that leopard frog would have between two and 5,000 eggs. That's a lot of babies. Uh, as, as a youngster, I was really interested the first time I saw this because I looked at that and I looked at, I looked at an egg mass this size and I thought, how big is the female frog? She's this big, this big, this big. That's not right. Then I realized they absorb water when they come out, swell up. Anyway. All right. Our biggest anurin here is the bullfrog. Many, many folks have heard about bullfrogs. Bullfrogs are, are the, the biggest uh, and they're in native to North America. They are native in parts of Texas. Um, they're popular for eating. They're popular for bait. Uh, they're also pretty neat to listen to. They've got a, a wonderfully deep croaking sound. They can grow to quite large size. Um, and their tadpoles can grow to quite large size also. Their, their uh, tadpoles can overwinter, and their tadpoles can sometimes spend more than two years as tadpoles. That's pretty unusual, but it's been recorded. Uh, so they'll just 
milk the environment for, for all that it's worth before they reach metamorphosis and transition into their adult phase. Now, a lot of people have heard about invasive bullfrogs, and invasive bullfrogs are a real problem um, for many reasons, but not least of which is their impact on other amphibian species. Bullfrogs are voracious eaters. They'll eat anything that moves that fits in their mouth. Uh, if anybody's got a, a um, Peterson field guide to amphibians and reptiles, there's a nice photo in there of a bullfrog eating a young water snake, which is a real ironic picture because adult water snakes eat small bullfrogs too. It's a kind of a teeter-totter in nature. Um, bullfrogs have been known to eat small birds and mice and even very small turtles. If it fits in their mouth and it's moving, they'll go for it, including their young. So they've been introduced uh, primarily because they're used as bait and people will take them other places, take them fishing and release anything they don't use. Um, but they've been, they've been um, a real problem in California and, and parts of Western United States. I mentioned a moment ago that they're native to parts of Texas. In this diagram, the orange range shows where they're native. And here's Texas, and here's the hill country, and wow, we are like, if you don't know your Texas maps, it's a little difficult to tell quite whether we're in their native range or not. So let's zoom in on Texas. And here in orange, we've got their native range over much of the Edwards Plateau. Um, but if I overlay this with the, with the river shed, watershed, rather, watershed map, uh, here is uh, the Guadalupe River watershed, and we are just in their native range. So if you see bullfrogs here, leave them be. They're native in this watershed. If you go south, they're not native. It's pretty amazing what boundaries rivers can be for, for species that are large and mobile and partially aquatic. You would think that one river would not, would not be the demarcation for their range, but it really can be. Okay. Here's another anurin for you. Our state amphibian, the Texas toad, the handsome, elegant Texas toad. All right, to be fair, this one's upset. It's taking a great big gulp of air. That's one thing they do that, uh, that helps them not get swallowed by bullfrogs and snakes and other predators and things like that. They like to puff up with air. We've got a species of snake, a couple species of snake, actually, in the hognose snake group who specialize in eating toads. They've got these great big teeth in the back of their mouth, one on each side, and they'll, they'll get one of these toads in their mouth, and then they'll just pop them like balloons, and then they can swallow them down real easy. And they're tolerant of the, of the toxins in, the, in, in these glands on their back. But it is our Texas State amphibian, so we have to respect it, right? This is... is Here's a, here's a better looking one. This is, this is a less stressed out Texas toad. Uh, these are pretty widespread in Texas and we can get them here in the hill country, although they don't like it in town very much. But, but if you get out of town, you may see some of these. Uh, one of the more famous amphibians in Texas is the Houston toad because of its endangered status. Houston toads are only found, their native range is only in this band of pine forest these pockets of pine forest, and each of these dots is, a, is an individual population. But, but collectively, uh, they're south of the Trinity River, west of Houston, east of Austin. They like pine forests with sandy soil, which is, which is a, a little bit of a tricky order. Um, and they've done well in this range for a long time, but as urbanization encroaches and things like wildfires get more intense, uh, some of you remember the wildfires from, what was it, about 10 years ago or so when, when Bastrop got hit so hard? Uh, many, many Texas toad populations got fried by those wild. Because they're not burning so regularly that you get this buildup and buildup and buildup of pine needles and other burnable elements, this fuel load, and they burn hotter and longer. Um. I can't get through all the species, so I'm going to lump some together here. We've got a couple species of spadefoots. We've got two or three more here in Texas, but spadefoot toads are pretty neat. They're not in the same group as the toads I mentioned earlier, so, so toad is a little bit misleading here. Um, these, these species really only come out when it has rained heavily, and they can breed in a temporary pond with no fish 
They breed fast. The tadpoles grow fast. Some of the tadpoles rely so much on poor nutrient ponds that they will eat each other as a survival strategy. They'll eat their siblings. They reach metamorphosis fast, and then they go back into loose soil and burrow as quickly as they can and wait for the next rain. And they've got these little shovel-like scoops on their back feet. That, that's where they get the name Spadefoot. Here we've got some members of our tree frog family, uh, just a couple of, a couple of species. We've got gray tree frogs in this area. That's our only tree frog that's very popular in the hill country. But as you go east, you can certainly find green tree frogs and spring peepers and a couple of other species. These are, again, more often heard than seen. They have excellent camouflage. These gray tree frogs, if you don't know what you're looking for and you don't hear them, they can be right beside you and you'll walk right by. They look like lichen on a tree or a rock. All right, let's, let's switch over to a different order now, the caudata. That's the salamanders and newts. Incidentally, biologists are not clever namers of things. Aneura, the, the etymology of aneura is without a tail. Caudata means tail-bearing. I don't know. Seems like there might be a better way to name things since most vertebrates have tails, but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, again, just going to hit some highlights here. I would love to spend more time on this with you all, but we just uh, we just don't have the time. So I got a diversity of, of salamander types here. Our biggest uh, native salamander is barred tiger salamander. This is a, a species that, that can get fairly large, sometimes up to a foot long and can spend uh, much of their life out of water, although they all breed in the, in the water. Uh, we've got a couple of groups of species in East Texas, the newts, and then in East Texas and South Texas, the water dog group that uh, spend their whole life in water or nearly their whole life in water. And then we've got a few members of this really interesting family, the Plethodontidae, that are lungless salamanders. They have no lungs at all. They're mostly terrestrial. The slimy salamander and its cousins don't lay eggs in the water. They lay eggs, and then the mom will curl her body around them and keep them moist with her skin. They breathe through their skin. That's how they get their oxygen, lacking lungs altogether. But they have no external gills, like, like these are the external gills on the water dog. These are just really amazingly sleek little animals. That means they can get into some really tight spots and protect themselves from predators. So that's an advantage. Um, I do want to just make a note of, of the gill situation on salamanders. This is different from tadpoles. Tadpoles have internal gills. So they breathe water into their head cavity, pass it over gills, and it comes out a little opening called a spiracle. Salamanders, when they have gills, have external gills, it, whether they are larvae or adults. So these little filamentous, feathery-looking things are salamander gills. Another thing to look out for with some of these salamanders is whether or not they have eyes. I want to talk about a group that's unique to the hill country I, I alluded to earlier, these underground aquifer-dwelling salamanders. Until recently thought to be fully aquatic. Turns out some of them are not absolutely aquatic. Um, but they all have gills, and some of them have functional eyes. Some do not. So this is not all the species, but this is a few of the species. The ones on the left here are blind. Um, and there are two different species with the name blind salamander, Texas blind and Austin blind salamander, that spend probably their entire life in the dark in caves and things like that. And then we've got some species over here on the right that do have eyes that can see just fine, and they come out and they swim around among the rocks and 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 debris and that, and that kind of thing. Um, I should have mentioned uh, in this previous slide, this is a salamander we found on a private ranch uh, just north of town here. So we've got these guys right here in Kerrville um, and, and points all around us. Um, if any of you get a chance, a uh, colleague at uh, Southwestern University, Ben Pierce, studies Georgetown salamanders and does just marvelous work with them and has found some, some really interesting things about um, full metamorphosis and things like that. Anyway, we've got some really cool stuff. Anybody who's been swimming at Barton Springs may know a little bit about the, at least the fact that Barton Springs salamanders are there, they're endangered, and uh, some of the pools have been isolated just to, just to help preserve them. Without getting into too much detail here, this is a, a map of a portion of the Edwards Aquifer 
And what we've got here are, are with these colored per, um, perimeters, these are areas where we've got distinct species, but you can see that some of them overlap as well. And a couple of recent studies that have come out have shown, just for my friends who really like to put things in boxes, I guess, that, that these things hybridize pretty regularly. And any one salamander may have the genetics of what we might like to call three different species. Species are a fluid thing. They're not fixed. And so it's, that's an important thing to remember, and this is a good opportunity to do so. Um, we've got a few species in Texas of, of eel-shaped salamanders. Sometimes they're even given names like Congo eel. Uh, that's, that's not true. They're not actually eels at all. They're not fish. But we've got sirens. And we've got uh, Amphiuma. Sirens do have external gills, which you can see here. And sirens, interestingly, have forelimbs, but no hind limbs. Amphiumas, on the other hand, actually do have forelimbs and hind limbs, but they're tiny and no external gills. And Amphiumas, I don't know if any of you have worked with the Amphiumas. Travis, have you ever worked, picked up? Okay. These suckers can bite and draw blood. So if you're ever planning to work with an Amphiuma, wear gloves. Some, some studies have suggested that the sirens that are in the Rio Grande may be greater siren, different species. Some studies have said they're not genetically distinct enough to call them a different species. That, that ball is still up in the air. All right. The Gymnophiona are the Sicilians, those worm-like ones I mentioned earlier. Just kidding. We don't have any in Texas. Go to the zoo. I think you can see a couple. So what's the big deal? Um, amphibians are important for a number of reasons that, that we just don't have time to go through all of right now, but uh, I'll touch on one or two reasons. But I want to, I, I specifically bring these two book titles up because these were book titles when I was in grad school, like, I don't know, 13,000 years ago or something. Uh, this is not news. Amphibians have been on the decline for quite a while. It's been well documented for quite a while. And every year or two, we get another groundbreaking paper with objective, clear data that says things are getting worse for amphibians. They are getting worse. So why are they getting worse? What are the biggest threats? Well, you may not be surprised by some of these threats. Uh, some of them are real familiar. Habitat conversion is affecting lots of kinds of biodiversity. Climate change is affecting lots of kinds of biodiversity. There are a couple of introduced diseases, and, and these are introduced by accident, that are specific to amphibians. A couple of fungal diseases that affect their skin, and they're killing off amphibians at record rates. They were first discovered at all in the late 1980s and have spread worldwide and wiped out entire species, but many populations without whole species too. Uh, pesticides are a big deal. A lot of my background is in the effects of pesticides on amphibians. Invasive species, including but not limited to outdoor cats, UVB radiation. But perhaps the most troubling thing for me is that we still know that they are declining for reasons we can't quite pinpoint. We can look at amphibian populations and say there are fewer than there have ever been in this population or this one went extinct, and we don't know why. So why should that matter? Well, there's a typo. That's embarrassing. Why should that matter to us? Okay. Often people will say, if, if for no other reason, if you're not into the amphibians for their own sake, they are very like humans. They're really not so different from people. And so you might pull up a tree of life like this and say, wait a second. If we look at these lineages... The bacteria are this little wedge over here and the archaea are over here. And then all of the eukaryotes are this whole big arc. And even from like from, from here over, these are all animals. And so we're over here on the mammal group and amphibians. That's like, I don't know, a fifth of the wheel apart. This is a this is a super misleading, this is a super misleading diagram. I as a teacher, I am always so disappointed when I see things that are so objectively distorted to emphasize humans biologically in the sense that we are a species. We are no more or less a species than a different species. So recently some genetic work was done and a, what I think a much better tree of life was produced, which is this one. And in this one, 
the width of each line is relative to the diversity of the species within it. So this, you don't have to see the details. This entire smear up top is bacterial diversity. All of these different lineages are bacterial lineages. And there are many more bacterial lineages than any other group. Here are the archaea down here. And then the eukaryotes, these are all the plants and fungi and animals over here. The opisthokonta, this includes the animals. So if we want to talk about how similar genetically amphibians and humans are, we're on the same stick on the right side here. That's a much truer representation of how different we are. We're much, much more the same than we are different. So if you're worried about humans, and I think it's fair to be, the amphibians can give us a signal that things are not great on this planet right now, and that we maybe should make some changes, or we could be the next group that is being documented as disappearing faster than we thought with, with no clear reason. And on that uplifting note, I will say thank you. I appreciate your time. And if there's time, I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes. That's a great question. So the question was about toads in the garden in summer and where they come from as, because you don't live near a water source. So there are two parts to that answer. One is if the toads are relatively big, two or three inches, then they probably did just come up from under a log or, or a rock or a burrow nearby. But if they're fairly small, under an inch, those are probably recent metamorphs from that year. So, so those are probably the ones that just came out of the water within the last few weeks. Toad dispersal is pretty phenomenal. Not just are they amazing because they reach metamorphosis at tiny size, and not just are they amazing because they reach explosive metamorphosis where a whole population might reach metamorphosis within a week, but they, toads, unlike uh, the, most of the frogs, can travel farther distances from water, sometimes up to a kilometer away. So, there are very few places in the hill country that are more than a kilometer from any surface water. So they're probably just working their way through looking for the best habitat. Could they be, the question was, could they be spade foot toads? Uh, theoretically, they could be, although you would probably know that, that they were spade foots if you were in a very sandy area, if your soil is very sandy, and if it had rained just an unbelievable amount. We've got a question. We have copes, gray tree frogs, and burning. Aren't those different than gray, or are they now lumped together? So I want to uh, answer that in two ways. Uh, first, by saying that what had previously been called copes, gray tree frogs, are, are now more um, commonly agreed on as being called uh, southern gray tree frogs. Uh, the, the, the copes, gray tree frogs were named after Edward Dinkler Cope, who was an outrageous racist. And I've been very delighted that all of the herpetological societies of North America this year, when that came to light, said, there's nothing biological calling that frog cope. So we are going to move away from that name. And so they call them Southern Gray Tree Frogs now. I showed you tree frog pictures earlier. Visually, the Southern Gray Tree Frog and the common gray tree frog are indistinguishable. They have slightly different calls. The southern gray tree frog has twice as many chromosomes as the common gray tree frog has. This is an accident during uh, cell division. This is a mutation. But uh, they are not, to, to answer the question, they are not considered separate species. Uh, they are considered still separate species. They've not been lumped together. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Unlikely. What do salamanders eat? Thank you. Uh, all adult amphibians, salamanders and anurans and Sicilians, are entirely carnivorous, and they're not scavengers. So they eat things that move. They, they mostly rely on vision. The exception there, of course, is the blind ones, which rely on touch. So the, the cave salamanders that live under us, or Sicilians that spend almost their entire life under the soil, they're working their way around, smelling, sure, but confirming that they've come up on something they can eat by touch. So salamanders eat 
largely uh, arthropods. They eat insects, spiders, mites, those kinds of things when they're terrestrial. Underwater, they'll eat things like daphnia, copepods, uh, fairy shrimp, some aquatic insects, but they really like the arthropods primarily. Yeah. How do you distinguish the sounds for frog calls? Great question. So there are, there are many online resources. If you're unsure, don't use YouTube. <laughs> Woo, there are so many incorrectly labeled calls on YouTube. Don't assume it's right. Um, there, there are online resources. Uh, if you're not sure what the sound is, I actually recommend two apps. One of them is called Herp Mapper, Herp Mapper, where you can load photo or audio files and very much like iNaturalist, get some feedback. The other one you can use is uh, Seek, which is uh, produced by iNaturalist, and that can help you with identification also. Um, there is a pretty good book on the frogs and toads of North America, the author of which is escaping me right now. It used to come with this round thing called a CD um, in the back, and you could you could play through all the different frog calls. Uh, I think that there is an online version of that, or that you can buy it from Amazon with a digital download. Uh, but I'm not certain of that. Good. Awesome. So Kim. Kim Ort has that. Uh, and there are a couple of museums that, that maintain online collections with recordings of calls. Uh, they, they, in my experience, I think mostly don't have absolutely all the amphibians of Texas, all the frogs and toads of Texas, but they've got many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So those are actually not newts. Those are not amphibians at all. Those are Mediterranean geckos, which are a lizard, but they are translucent. As you say, that's a, that's an excellent observation. Yeah. And they're not native to Texas. They're not native to the Americas at all. Uh, but they, they're pretty widespread in the South and uh, a pretty neat animal. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, the question was about uh, toxic, toxic uh, species like the, like the Bufo marinus in Florida. Um, the, the marine toad, Bufo marinus, uh, is not native to, the, to North America. It's native to South America. It can grow to great size, produces some extraordinary amounts of toxin. So uh, it is invasive in parts of the U.S., including parts of Texas. So that species is in Texas. Uh, but nothing native produces quite as much toxin as that. So if your dog eats a toad, uh, it's not probably going to react quite as much as it would if it ate or chewed on a marine toad. With that said, all amphibian species produce toxins in their skin. So all those little bumps on the backs of toads and other frogs, those are all glands that produce various kinds of mucus and toxin. So don't lick the toads, don't smoke the newts, right? Uh, it's not good for you and it's not good for them. Um, if you handle amphibians anytime, wash your hands. There's a couple of kinds that can really irritate the eyes, even causing temporary blindness if you get their skin secretions into your eyes. Uh, but you don't want to ingest any of their secretions that can lead to that can lead to real problems for you, for kids, for pets. So Directly to answer your question, uh, Bufo marinus is now in Texas in small pockets, but it's not widespread. Um, but none of our native species are just quite that toxic. If we have time, I don't know. We may not. Okay. I'll stick around a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you.